I have been asked to set the uh, theological context of our discussion, and the theme that, that we turn to is leadership and vocation. Let me begin by posing, and then going on to answer, the, the question, uh, what is the mission of Catholic healthcare generally? This might be embarrassingly obvious in a group as august as this, but nonetheless, that's where I'm going to start. To answer the question, what is the mission, uh, it's not stewards of a mission, it's stewards of the mission. There is only one mission. There are many forms of stewardship of the one mission. So what is the mission of Catholic health care? And to answer the question, or at least to begin answering the question, I turn back to the pages of the New Testament. Because you cannot begin to understand what happens in our vast institutions, which are in many ways the jewels in our crown, unless you go back to the healing ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, there were many others who, who worked healings, at times miraculous. But in the New Testament, they are given a quite specific interpretation. They are understood as proclamations of what Jesus himself called the kingdom of God and its eruption into the human arena. So that in the, in the healings, there is the, the first eruption of the kingdom or the reign of God. All of those healings that are recounted in the Gospels are recounted with an eye to Easter. There is nothing in the Gospels that is not recounted in the light of Easter. So in other words, the healings of Jesus look ultimately to the resurrection. And again, if you don't see that, you don't understand what the healings are. In other words, the kingdom of God erupts finally and fully only when Jesus is raised from the dead. In that sense, death is understood as the cosmic wound. And the cosmic healing comes when Jesus is raised from the dead. In that sense, and only in that sense, can you understand Catholic health care through the ages and therefore now as first and foremost a witness to Easter. Therefore, if we build a hospital or an aged care facility or any of the institutions that, that we build and uh, run, they are monuments to Easter. And by that I mean that they witness to the triumph of life over death. Now, hospitals are full of sick people, and many of those sick people die in hospitals. So they are places of sickness and death, but they are places where we say that however powerful and persistent the word of sickness and death may be, it's not the last word. That the last word, in fact, belongs not to death or to sickness and its final seal in death, but to life. So, so to see our institutions and all that we do, the mission. The mission is to proclaim the triumph of life over death in a world where there seems to be overwhelming evidence to the contrary. We live in a world that's where, where we seem to drown in death and where there are monuments to death left, right and centre. In such a world and in a deeply countercultural, indeed revolutionary way, the Christians are those who say no, this hospital, this facility, this institution is not a monument to death and its inevitability or its triumph. This is a monument to Easter, the triumph of life over death. Jesus, therefore, in our institutions is not once upon a time as some pale-faced role model. Jesus is in our institutions as presence and power. And if that's not true, then again, inevitably, our institutions will be monuments to death and its triumph and not to life and its triumph. The other important perspective on all of this is to understand the mission as a mission of the whole church. This is fundamentally important. The mission of the whole, which belongs to the whole church to witness to Easter and the triumph of life, therefore, is entrusted by the whole community to some members of the church, people like you and those who have run our hospitals and other institutions. The church does that in trusting in the name of Christ. And this touches upon a, a fundamental point of ecclesiology and understanding of the church. The church is not just another human institution, though God knows it often looks like it. The church is, in the words of Paul, and I think they're some of the most extraordinary words ever concocted, the body of Christ. In other words, not a corpse which left to its own devices can only putrefy, but a living body radiant with the life that is bigger than death. 
So it is that community entrusted by Christ with the mission to proclaim the triumph of life over death that then entrusts to some members of the community the particular mission that we call Catholic health care. This entrustment in the name of the whole church is also a vocation or a call. And again, the call comes not from the church understood as just another human community or organisation, but from Christ himself. So Christ, through the church, his body, calls you or whoever to undertake this mission, this Easter mission, in the name of the whole church. So it's a call from Christ, sealed by the church. It's like if someone comes to me and says, I feel called to the priesthood, then... uh, I would say, well, that's fine, but that call needs to be tested and honed and ultimately to be confirmed by the church, which is what ordination is. The church confirms that in this person's life there is divine vocation. So so it's, it's that kind of partnership. So you are called by Christ and that call is confirmed by the church. Because this work of healthcare, the mission, is a work of the whole church, the bishops do enter... Now, this is a very delicate thing to discuss, particularly in my own case, where I I was in my years in Canberra involved in a very complex, long-winded and finally somewhat bruising saga with regard to Calvary Hospital. But that whole um, episode made me ponder the the history of Catholic healthcare in this country where for, for many, many years it was left to the sisters who did an absolutely magnificent job. And the bishops, as distinct from education, where the bishops did get involved for quite specific reasons historically, the bishops tended to look the other way or to be quite disengaged from health care. I now think we are at a point, at a threshold moment in the ongoing journey of Catholic health care where that can no longer be true, where the bishops would be derelict if we did not engage in a new and creative way. This does not mean ham-fisted interference though it can resolve to that in the end, unfortunately, but that's not the intention. But a new and more creative engagement of the bishops to to ensure that the mission remains and and becomes more deeply a work and mission of the whole church. If I might just say in, in, in passing that I think we live in a time of new synergies. Some of them, and Frank Brennan's question earlier, Uh, made the point. Some of them forced upon us and yesterday I attended the first meeting of the Truth, Justice and Healing Council and there is no question that the pressure of the Royal Commission is proving creative in the sense that it's forcing us to coordinate and collaborate in new ways. But I've seen it in 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 a hundred different ways in recent times that we are being called and I think it is called not just forced to explore and enact new kinds of synergies within the Catholic Church, and that can sound easy, but it is not. Uh, it's not Frank used the, the, the word, the independence of lay people. It's true, and yet it's not true. It's the, what I saw yesterday was the, the profoundly ecclesial identity of lay people, uh, highly expert lay people in this case, like you. But sitting down around a table with bishops, uh, not as independent agents, but as as those who are baptised and therefore called to to enter into mission, but to do so in a radically ecclesial way. And if I talk about new synergies, I am talking about new and and deeper ways of being the church. And I think that is one of the signs of the times, one of the things the Spirit is most certainly saying to the church at this time. In the past... The link between leadership and vocation in healthcare, particularly, was simply taken for granted. And that was because religious ran the hospitals and all the other institutions associated with healthcare. They were called by God to be religious, and as religious, they undertook the remarkable mission that has led to the establishment of some of the great healthcare institutions of this country. However, the link between leadership and vocation can be thought to be less obvious. Once well-paid lay professionals, like many of you, assume responsibility for those institutions. That you're not, it may be thought, you're not called, you don't have a vocation in the way, say, the sisters did. But I would claim here 
that if Catholic healthcare is to remain truly Catholic, and in a sense to become more deeply ecclesial, indeed Christian, the link between leadership and vocation must be maintained, albeit in a new mode. So, so my claim, therefore, is that each of you is called no less to the mission of Catholic health care than were the sisters or any other religious or clergy who were involved and are still involved in the, the great mission of Catholic health care. Now, what does it mean to say you're called? At this point, I turn very briefly to the scripture, and I do, I do so conscious that we have to become a more biblical church. Now, if you look at the call stories in, the, in the, uh, the Bible, there is a pattern to them, and this is your life. This is not once upon a time. Uh, I now take the Bible as a kind of archetype that, that interprets the truth of your experience and the, and the truth of, of your call. If you look at all of the uh, call of figures like Moses and David and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Mary and Peter, you can see that the call, as it were, comes out of nowhere. They don't see it coming. They're not saying, sitting around saying, well, I wonder what time he's going to pop out and call me. It comes out of nowhere and is deeply disconcerting and often shakes the very foundation of their whole religious cosmos, turns life on its head. It usually comes in the midst of the ordinary. They're just doing their ordinary stuff. And the call of God in Scripture never comes in some phantasmagoric other world. Moses is tending the sheep, David's also out tending sheep, Isaiah's in the temple in Jerusalem as he would have been thousands of times, Jeremiah's up at home in Anatoth, Mary's at home in Nazareth, no one had ever heard of that place, Peter's fishing, you see what I mean? It's in the midst of the ordinariness that the call comes and it's a call to mission, to go out and often to go out in, in dangerous ways. Moses says, who am I to go to Pharaoh? The, the mission, it seems to be mission impossible and usually there is... Um, not only a disproportion between the one called and the mission to which he or she is called, but there are positive protests. Moses says, I can't speak, I'm not eloquent enough. David, David is considered by others to be too young. Well, there's, there's only the one out in the fields looking after the sheep, but he's too young to be the king. Uh, Isaiah says, I'm a man of unclean lips, I'm lost. Uh, Mary says, how can this be? Because I'm a virgin. Peter says, leave me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. So the pattern, therefore, is clear. The, the, the mission comes out of nowhere. In your ordinary world, it seems to be asking you to do more than is reasonable or even possible for you with your capacities. You protest and God says, I don't care how incapable you think you are. Uh, I will equip you in ways that you do, do not foresee or expect. I will empower you for the very mission which, which left to your own devices, you can't do it. But I, whose mission this is, whose work you will do, I will equip you. So get out there and do it. In the end, and here again I invoke scripture, we are stewards of a work, a mission not our own. We serve a plan. A plan which is not always easy to see, the plan of God unfolding in the world, the plan which is the triumph of life over death, but a plan which, however difficult it can be to see, is intelligible to those who are properly intelligent. And leadership means to be properly intelligent, a capacity to read the unfolding of God's plan in all its strangeness and magnificence. Now, to be faithful to that call and to serve the plan that is not our own. We indulge in planning of all kinds, but we are stewards, servants of a plan that cannot be our own. It must be the plan of God that takes flesh in Jesus Christ. For us to be faithful to that call as leaders will require of us what it required of St. Paul. And I just quickly touch upon the figure of St. Paul, again as an archetype of Christian leadership, of the man called to lead in the name of Christ. What do you see in Paul that is archetypal? In other words, this is your life. A sense, an unshakable sense of divine call. In other words, I don't care what you say, I was called by Christ with all my faults and failings. So an uns unshakable sense of divine call, a quality that flows from that, a quality of passion and immense physical energy. 
teamwork. Paul was not an isolated Lone Ranger. He was the head of a large, complex, and I might add costly, missionary operation, and he gathered the right people around himself, people like Silas and Timothy, or Silvanus as Silas becomes in the letters. So a profound sense of the necessity of teamwork and the need to work collaboratively. Paul is unafraid of conflict or criticism, and he copped plenty of both. But he knows when to, to fight and when not to fight, just as he knows when to compromise and when not to compromise. If the leader doesn't, the Christian leader doesn't ever compromise or is always compromising, it will not be the leadership that's required. So to know when to, to enter the lists, when to, to fight, but also to know when to compromise and when not to, and yet communion is always the far horizon. Conflict and division are never accepted as an inevitable state of affairs or as a point of arrival. The far horizon is always that Greek word that Paul uses constantly, koinonia, the communion of the Holy Spirit, as we say in the liturgy. Uh, never to settle for less than that and always to be asking the question, how might we move beyond whatever difficulties we now face to the far horizon of the communion which is in Christ? Paul knows the past and so must we, but he's absolutely afraid of the new, unafraid of the new, even when it's the shockingly new. We perhaps have a diminished sense of how extraordinary it was for Paul, the Pharisee, to sit down and eat with Gentiles. And yet he did it. It was shockingly new. And it shocked even those good Jewish Christians who came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. So he, he's not afraid of the shockingly new and not afraid to take what seemed to others to be absurd risks like crossing from Asia Minor into Europe to found the community at Philippi, just across the Dardanelles, as we now call them. So to enter new territory, he is completely unafraid, and I think that is archetypal for us. He also embodies the message. He says in Galatians, when God was pleased to reveal his son in me, usually the translations say through me. There's no manuscript evidence to support that. Paul dictated, was pleased to reveal his son in me, in a moi. So you become the revelation. Now that's a big call, but that is the call. That we have to become the revelation. It's not a disembodied message. The good news is us. It's embodied, not just in me, but in us. The body of Christ. And in the end, Paul stands forever as a figure who is empowered through powerlessness. If you look at the story of his apostolic journeys, it's a descent into, from one depth to another of powerlessness until he lies as a corpse without a head. But the, the, the mystery of the Lord's cross is, is such that through that deepening em, uh, disempowerment, powerlessness, there is another kind of empowerment, and that is the power of Christ that shines through human weakness. All of that, it seems to me, is no less true of us who are called to be leaders in Catholic healthcare at this time. I conclude then by referring to the logo of Catholic Healthcare, Catholic Health Australia, which is behind me in front of you. The Southern Cross and the hands, but I ask, are the stars descending into the hands or arising from it? It's hard to know, isn't it? The fact is, I think it's both, at least as I read the sign, but the truth that we contemplate here is that the Southern Cross must first of all come into the hands. The cross must come into the hands, that's the call, before the stars then go forth from the hands and that's the mission.